Anpu and Bata. The tale of Anpu and Bata, found in an ancient Egyptian papyrus manuscript, is more than 3,000 years old and is regarded as the oldest story that has come down to us in writing. It may well have been an ancient tradition even then. One of the most interesting things about it is that elements found in tales all over the world ever since are contained in it. The first part has a parallel in the biblical story of Joseph and the wife of Potiphar. The core of the story, the life token indicating death and the separable soul, occurs in over 800 versions in Europe alone, and the reciters are unlikely to know that they are part of a line of transmission from the 19th dynasty of Pharaonic Egypt. The story is sometimes found conflated with all or much of the Perseus and Andromeda myth, associated with the exploits of a dragon slayer, which is encountered in almost every country in the world. The crumbling papyrus roll in the British Museum contains a message from the original scribe, a threat to those who might abuse it, which is similar to those found on Eastern manuscripts even today. Excellently finished in peace for the car of the scribe of the treasury Kagabu, of the treasury of Paho, and for the scribe Hora and the scribe Meramapt, written by the scribe Anena, the owner of this roll. He who speaks against this scroll, may Tahui smite him. It was the custom of eastern kings, when pleased with a story related to them, to order it to be written down and placed in the treasury. Once there lived in Egypt two brothers, and they loved each other greatly. The elder had a beautiful young wife and a fine pair of oxen for the fields. His name was Anpu, and his younger brother's name was Bata. This young man did everything for his brother followed him and the oxen to the fields, waited upon him like a servant, harvested the corn, tended the animals. He worked for him day and night, for his brother, in his eyes, had no equal in all the land of Egypt. Now when the time for ploughing the land arrived, the elder brother said to Bata, Come with the seeds tomorrow early to the fields, for we must begin sowing, because the Nile flood has retreated from the earth and the day is propitious. Anpu having gone on ahead, it was left for Bata to bring the seed. So he went to the door of the house and said to his sister-in-law, Anpu's beautiful young wife, Let me have the corn from the bin, for my brother and I need it today. The woman replied, Come in and get it yourself, for I am busy doing my hair, and I cannot drop my pins and ribbons and get the corn. So he went in, and helped himself to as much corn as he could carry, for he wanted to start the day of planting well, as the day was propitious. Seeing him carrying such a load, the wife of his brother said, You are strong and good-looking, indeed. I had not noticed that you were so presentable before. Come, stay with me a little while here before you go to the fields, for you will both be away all day, and I shall be lonely. Give me something to remember when I am alone. Bata recoiled at the woman's words, and his face darkened with rage. He said, You are like a mother to me, for are you not my respected brother's wife? I will forget what you have just spoken. Do you forget it also? and he went away to the fields, trying to erase her suggestion from his mind, for she was his brother's wife, and though beautiful, now appeared evil in his eyes. All day they laboured in the fields, and at evening Anpu and Bata returned home. They expected to find food ready as usual when they came to the house, but there was no fire, no light, no smell of cooking. Bata went to the stable to attend to the animals, and Anpu went in to see what was the matter with his wife. She was lying huddled under the quilt, 
crying as if she were in pain. What is the matter with you? he asked. Has anyone been here in my absence to upset you like this? The only one here in your absence was your wretched brother, she cried. Ask him what is the matter with me. But what are you saying? Has he laid hands upon you? shouted the enraged husband. Yes, she replied. I was here doing my hair when he came in for the seeds, and he said to me, Be with me a while before I go to the fields, and my brother will never know. And he violated me. Oh, I cannot look at you for shame, my husband. So Anpu sharpened his knife and stood outside the stable, ready to kill his brother as soon as he came to join him for the evening meal. All unaware of this, the younger brother went about his tasks in the stable, when suddenly his favourite cow spoke to him. Beware, Bata, your brother has sharpened his knife and is waiting to kill you behind the door. Run, do not go back to the house or you will die. The young man looked out of the stable and saw his brother standing strangely still with his knife in his hand. Fearing that he could never explain the true state of affairs to his brother, he made a hole in the mud wall of the barn and fled as fast as his feet would carry him. But the elder brother heard him running and chased after him. The light of murder was in his eyes. So in great fear, Bata called out, O great Ra Harakiti, mighty lord, you are he who divides the evil from the good. Save me. And Ra answered his prayer. A mighty river sprang up between the two brothers, a river that Anpu could not cross, even if he had had a boat, for it was full of crocodiles. The elder brother was furious that he could not reach Bata to kill him, and cursed him from the other bank. But Bata called out in a loud voice to him, O oh, my brother, do not think ill of me. I cannot prove to you that I did nothing wrong, but my cow warned me, and I fled from you in fear. Why did you come to kill me before you asked me if I had done what you believed I did? And his brother said, Tell me yourself then what truly happened. Bata answered, I went to the bin to get the seed myself, for your wife told me she was doing her hair and did not wish to leave her toilette to attend to me. Then after I had helped myself, she said I looked strong and handsome, and tempted me to stay with her for a short while, saying that you would not know. You see how the truth has been changed. Will you swear the oath by Ra Harakiti that what you have said is true? cried the elder brother. By Ra Harakiti I swear that it is true, said the younger brother, and he took his knife and cut a piece of his flesh and threw it into the water, and the crocodiles ate it. Then the elder brother was satisfied, and he wept for Bata and cursed his wife. He knew that he could not reach his brother because of the crocodiles, and he stood there putting away his knife. Now we know that you have done a bad thing, trying to kill me. Will you now do a good thing for me? said Bata. Anpu said he would. So his brother told him, I am going away to the valley of the acacia, so you go to your house and look to your cattle. Now this is what you can do for me. My soul should be drawn out and put into the flower of the acacia. When the acacia is cut down, as it will be, put the flower in a glass of cold water, for my soul shall be in it. When someone gives you a glass of beer in your hand, and it is agitating in the glass, then do not stay, but go and find the flower, even if you search for seven years, and put it in the water. Farewell. Then the youth stopped speaking these strange things and went to the valley of the acacia. His brother turned away and went back to his house, and he was angered against his wife, so he killed her in the heat of his wrath. Then he threw his knife away and looked after his cattle and his fields himself, sorrowing for his brother. 
A long time after this had happened, the younger brother was living in the valley of the acacia. He had drawn out his soul, and it lived in the topmost flower of the acacia tree. He had built himself a small house in which he lived, and it was full of good things. One day, walking in the valley, he met the nine gods, who were going forth to look upon the whole land of Egypt. The nine gods were talking with each other when Bata came upon them, and they said to him, O Bata, bull of the nine gods, why are you walking alone? Your brother has slain his wife, and all is level between you. His transgression is forgiven. Then, as Bata knelt before them, Ra Harakiti said to Khnumu, So that he will not be forever alone, make a woman for Bata, a mate for his loneliness. And Khnumu made a wife for him. She was more beautiful than any woman had ever been before. The seven Hathors came to see her when she was created, and they said of one accord, She will die a sharp death, though the essence of every god is in her. All the day Bata hunted, and in the evening he came back and placed all his spoils at his wife's feet, for he loved her very much. He said to her one day, Now I must warn you, never go too near the sea, for if it should seize you and want to carry you away, I cannot save you, for my soul is in the flower at the top of the acacia, and I have no power other than in that flower. When she heard his secret, she smiled and thought about it much. Next day she went to walk beside the sea, and the sea saw her and began to cast its waves up towards her. She took to her heels and, being frightened by the passion of the sea, ran away from it. She entered her house, and the sea called to the acacia, I want to have that woman. I wish that I could take her. Then the acacia brought a curl from her hair, which the woman had cut off while sitting under the tree, and dropped it into the water. The sea carried it to the place where the fullers washed the clothes of the pharaoh. One of the washerwomen who was standing on the sand picked up the curl of hair, and it smelt so sweet that it almost took his senses away. He put it into the clothing which was being taken to Pharaoh, and when Pharaoh smelt it, he was enraptured. Where did this rare and wonderful scent come from? cried Pharaoh. Bring the wise men, so that they too may smell it and tell me. The wise men came with their signs and portents, and told the Pharaoh, and the scent comes from the curl from the hair of a daughter of Ra Harakiti. The essence of every god is in her. Send messengers to the borders of the sea, and in the valley of the acacia she will be found. So the pharaoh sent many men to the valley of the acacia, and they tried to take the wife of Bata, but he killed them all. None of these men returned to pharaoh, and so he sent more this time men on horseback and strong soldiers to bring her to him. Bata had to let her go, but they did not kill him. He remained behind under the acacia, feeling very distressed. Somehow, from his mind, he tried to send a message to his brother, reminding him of what he had said to Anpu across the river of the crocodiles the last time that he had seen him. The beautiful woman pleased the pharaoh very much, and he gave her everything in his power. Pharaoh, said she, after he had presented her with gold and jewels and rarest rings, send men to cut down the acacia, for my husband's soul is in the topmost flower, and I would that he were dead. So the men went and chopped the tree in the valley, so that the topmost flower, in which was the soul of Bata, fell to the ground, and he too fell dead. At that very moment someone handed Anpu, the elder brother, a glass of beer, and the liquid became agitated as he was about to drink it. He remembered what his brother had told him all that long time ago. 
He got his stick and his sandals, his clothes for travelling, and set off. He travelled all day and all night, and arrived at the valley of the acacia. Then he saw that the tree had been cut down, and saw the body of his brother lying dead. He wept bitterly, and looked everywhere for the flower which contained the soul of his brother. But he could not find it. He lay down to sleep under the tree, and said to himself, Tomorrow, and tomorrow, and tomorrow I will seek it, for I will spend all the days of my life, if necessary, to find the flower. Next day he did not find it, but he discovered, in a crack in the earth, a seed. He put the seed in a glass of water, and it sprouted. It was soon the flower containing his brother's soul. Within a few minutes the body of Bata shuddered under the cloth which covered it, and soon he was standing well and strong before Anpu. They embraced each other joyfully, and sat talking together for many hours. Then Bata said to his brother, I am to become a great bull by favour of the gods, and you are to get on my back. By the time the sun has risen thrice, I shall be in the place where my wife makes a fool of the pharaoh. And when I am before the pharaoh, you shall be taken to him, and he will give you gold and silver and good things in return. I will be thought of by all as a great marvel, and you will return to our old village home a rich man. Before Anpu's eyes he turned into a huge bull. So the elder brother got onto his back, and within three days they were before the pharaoh. The pharaoh had never before seen such a fine creature in all dominions of the upper and the lower Nile, so he gave many presents to the elder brother, and took Bata in his bull form to the royal stables to be looked after in great style. The gigantic bull was so tame that it was often garlanded with flowers by the royal ladies. One day when his wife, now a princess by command of the pharaoh, came near to him, the bull said in his human voice, I am alive, and now the gods have in their wisdom caused me to be in this marvellous bull's body. She was greatly affrighted, and wondered how she could get rid of her husband yet again. So she went to the pharaoh and said, My lord, I will never be happy unless I have for my illness the liver of that creature, which I am sure is fit for nothing else but to be eaten. So at once the pharaoh gave orders for the animal to be slaughtered, and said, Let the liver be given to the princess, so that she will soon be well again. A tremendous feast was planned, and the bull was to be sacrificed to the gods. As he was being slaughtered, the bull shook two drops of blood from his shoulder wound onto the walls of the royal palace. The blood dripped from each side of the gigantic door, and where the blood soaked into the ground, two persia trees grew. They grew and grew, each day taller, and each of them was perfect in every way. A courtier went to tell the pharaoh, Lo, there are two giant trees growing, one on each side of the great door of the palace. These are propitious signs, O pharaoh. And there was much rejoicing because of these trees, and many people made offerings to them because of their miraculous growth from the bull's blood. The ladies of the court went out and placed garlands of flowers around the trees and prayed to them. When his wife came, Bata said to her from the trees in his own voice, which she knew so well, Deceitful woman, I am Bata, who you have thrice betrayed. First you went to the pharaoh, then you had my soul tree cut down, and then you had the ox slain. Now I am in the strength of these trees. I shall never die. So the princess went to the pharaoh and said, As you love me, will you do me a small favour? I do not like the sight of those two grotesque persia trees, one on each side of the great door of the palace. Do you please give orders that they be cut down, for they grow even uglier every day? and one day they will bring the palace down, I am sure. The pharaoh, 
besotted with his love for her, consented, and the next day woodcutters were chopping with might and main at the beautiful persia trees. The princess was standing not far away, looking at this activity, rejoicing in her heart, when a tiny chip of wood flew into her mouth. She was so startled that she swallowed it. The trees were at that moment completely cut down and fell outside the palace gates. When nine months had passed, a son was born to the princess, and there was rejoicing all through the land, for the pharaoh thought that the child was his son. As the months went by, the pharaoh loved the baby even more and raised him to be the royal son of Cush, heir of all the lands of the upper and lower Nile. Not many days after that the pharaoh died. Then the prince, the heir of the lands, said, Let all my nobles come before me, that I may tell them all that has happened to me. They came, and he told them everything. His elder brother was brought from the village to be made a minister at his court. Then they brought his wife, and they judged her, and she received her punishment. He was thirty years king of Egypt, and so endeared himself to the people that his brother took his place when he died. God is stronger. A Hebrew hymn relating to the Holy Land, beginning A Kid, A Kid My Father Bought, is closely similar to the English rhymed tale The House That Jack Built. Varieties of this cumulative tale are found in Norse and in Punjabi and in Sri Lanka. Similar stories have been noted in Scotland and Kashmir. This is the version found in traditional Malagasy folklore, recorded in Madagascar, the Malagasy Republic. Ibotiti had climbed a tree when the wind blew. The tree split, Ibotiti fell, and his leg was broken. The tree is strong, for it broke my leg, he said. It is the wind which is stronger than the tree, said the tree. But the wind said that the hill was stronger, since it could stop the wind. Ibotiti, of course, thought that strength was of the hill, to be able to stop the wind, which split the tree which broke his leg. No, said the hill, explaining that the mouse was strong, for it could burrow into the hill. But the mouse denied this, for I can be killed by the cat. And so Ibotiti thought that the cat must be strongest of all. Not so. The cat explained that it could be caught by a rope, and Ibotiti thought that this, then, must be the strongest thing. The rope, however, explained that it could be cut by iron, which was therefore stronger. The iron, in its turn, denied being strongest since it could be made soft by fire. Ibotiti now thought that the fire must be strongest to soften the iron, which cut the rope, which bound the cat, which caught the mouse, which undermined the hill, which stopped the wind, which split the tree, which broke the leg of Ibotiti. The fire then said that water was stronger, and the water claimed that the canoe was yet stronger, for it cleft the water. But the canoe was overcome by the rock, and the rock by man, and man by the magician, and the magician by the ordeal by poison, and the ordeal by God, so God is the strongest of all. Then Ibotiti knew that God could beat the ordeal, which stopped the magician who overwhelms man, who breaks the rock, which overcomes the canoe, which cleaves the water, which puts out fire, which softens iron, which severs the rope, which binds the cat, which kills the mouse, which undermines the hill, which stops the wind, which splits the tree, which breaks the leg of Ibotiti. The Happiest Man in the World Although this tale is found in the storybooks of both the East and West, it is far less often represented there than most traditional tales. Taoists and Sufi masters are reputed to have used it to illustrate the theme that 
The quest is what teaches you that only the end has meaning, not the assumption of what the end might be. This is the only story in this collection which seems to be increasing in currency, particularly in the oral transmission. When I was collecting tales in Europe, Asia and Africa a quarter of a century ago, I did not find a single example. Between 1960 and 1978, however, no fewer than ten storytellers in six different countries provided versions. The particular shape given here is a current one from Uzbekistan. The tale is more usually found as a two-liner, something like this. A man once heard that he would attain to wisdom if he could meet the happiest man in the world and obtain his shirt. It took him nearly all his life to find him, and then he noticed that the happiest man did not own a shirt. A man who was living in comfortable enough circumstances went one day to see a certain sage, reputed to have all knowledge. He said to him, Great sage, I have no material problems, and yet I am always unsettled. For years I have tried to be happy, to find an answer to my inner thoughts, to come to terms with the world. Please advise me as to how I can be cured of this malaise. The sage answered, My friend, what is hidden to some is apparent to others. Again, what is apparent to some is hidden to others. I have the answer to your ailment, though it is no ordinary medication. You must set out on your travels, seeking the happiest man in the world. As soon as you find him, you must ask him for his shirt and put it on. This seeker thereupon restlessly started looking for happy men. One after another he found them and questioned them. Again and again they said, Yes, I am happy, but there is one happier than me. After travelling through one country after another for many, many days, he found the wood in which everyone said lived the happiest man in the world. He heard the sound of laughter coming from among the trees and quickened his step until he came upon a man sitting in a glade. Are you the happiest man in the world, as people say? he asked. Certainly I am, said the other man. My name is so-and-so, my condition is such-and-such, and my remedy, ordered by the greatest sage, is to wear your shirt. Please give it to me, I will give you anything I have in exchange. The happiest man looked at him closely, and he laughed. He laughed, and he laughed, and he laughed. When he had quietened down a little, the restless man, rather annoyed at this reaction, said, Are you unhinged, that you laugh at such a serious request? Perhaps, said the happiest man, but if you had only taken the trouble to look, you would have seen that I do not possess a shirt. What then am I to do now? You will now be cured. Striving for something unattainable provides the exercise to achieve that which is needed, as when a man gathers all his strength to jump across a stream as if it were far wider than it is. He gets across the stream. The happiest man in the world then took off the turban whose end had concealed his face. The restless man saw that he was none other than the great sage who had originally advised him. But why did you not tell me all this years ago, when I came to see you? The restless man asked in puzzlement. Because you were not then ready to understand. You needed certain experiences, and they had to be given to you in a manner which would ensure that you went through them.